the picture of how traumatic stress expresses itself changes with the culture. Uh, so I learned about traumatic stress first from Vietnam veterans and how do Vietnam veterans express their trauma? The most common complaint that they come in with in the clinic is I have become a monster, nobody is safe with me. I blow up at my kids and then maybe the most scary thing is that I sleep with somebody at night and suddenly in the middle of the night that person touches me and I strangle them and I try to kill them. And then I wake up, so I become more aware. I say, what the hell am I doing trying to strangle this poor girl who's, sleep, who's sleeping in my bed? Huh? So that their whole animal brain has become set to see the world as a terrifying, dangerous place and to defend yourself. That was the chief complaint. When we put the, D, P, the D, PTSD diagnosis together, we did not say, um, these people have become monsters and you shouldn't sleep with them because they may attack you. Because, you know, we, we were an advocacy group and we wanted to make sure that you guys get good treatment. So things change. And so I'm working at the VA and in the psychiatry department. And I think how strange all the people who come here are in their 20s, a few in their early 30s, but hardly anybody in their 40s, 50s, 60s. No Korean Second World War veterans. But the, the building is filled with old guys. So I go up to the medical floors, the gastroenterology service and the pulmonology service, and I do little surveys of these geezers. And uh, the little PTSD questionnaires, they all have PTSD. But their symptoms are somatic symptoms. That's in their gut, in their heart, in their belly. So things keep changing. And I haven't seen enough Iraqi or Afghani veterans to know how, if the picture is changing again today from how it was 30 years ago, because the culture changes things. And what we saw in the 1980s was very interesting, is that our patients basically came in with the chief complaint of, I am, nobody is safe with me. I just can't concentrate, I can't work, I can't be alive, I can't be here, I'm an out of control nutcake. And then we made up this diagnosis of PTSD. It's not a bad diagnosis, actually. It's quite, quite good. It captures a lot of stuff. And what's interesting, at that point, our patients slowly started to develop PTSD. Because the language that we spoke was the language of PTSD. So the language that we heard was what people communicated to us. So if people would say to us, we have nightmares, we'd say, oh, tell me about your nightmares. So we went after our little diagnostic criteria, and we selectively paid attention to what was in the textbook and to see if our patient match was in the textbook. And so that keeps sort of changing. Depending on what textbook you read, you start seeing things. And depending on what your doctor listens to, you will tell that doctor about that particular thing. Um, so it's all an interaction. What people suffer from is a question of what we are willing and able and eager to listen to. Um, for example, it took me years to find out that a lot of people with incest histories have no feelings in large swath of their bodies. Their bodies are a territory that's where nothing happens. Or their bodies are ter territories where they are on fire and constantly running away with them. But since that's not in the textbook, you don't ask for that. As it takes a little longer, and then it turns out to be a huge problem. Um, so we have our ideas, and our patients have their set of problems that have no words to it, and our ideas give our patients words to attach their problems to. But depending on the words that we use, our patients have different words for their own symptoms. So things change. <laughs>